As we recognize the territories that we're all on, uh, wherever we are calling in from today. So I'd like to acknowledge that I am coming to you today from Toronto, which is the traditional lands of many nations, which include Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. One of the things that I'm doing is learning what I can about these different treaties um, so that I can understand the history and the intent of what was supposed to happen around the caretaking of this land. And I also invite all of you joining us today to think about where you are and what that means for you and what this has meant over time. So as I said, we're delighted to have you all here today to discuss the impactful projects um, that we are have actively supported uh, and that have actively supported young people and youth ministries. My name is Jenna, I'm the foundation coordinator. So if any of you have also applied for a Seeds of Hope grant in the last uh, year or so, you have likely spoken to me and dealt with me. Um, I have the great privilege of being able to work with Seeds of Hope applicants, which gives me the wonderful opportunity to hear about so many different amazing projects and programs that are happening um, through all of our uh, different uh, uh, United Church of Canada organizations and communities of faith. So the Seas of Hope granting program, for those of you who might not be as familiar with it, is the granting program uh, from the foundation here that grants primarily to new and innovative programs and projects, but we have a lot of different ways that we're able to support the foundation's priorities, as well as other programs and priority areas for uh, communities of faith. And it's been a really amazing thing to be able to uh, connect with the communities of faith on the things that are important to their contexts and spaces. So I just opened up here, um, sharing my screen to the Seeds of Hope webpage. And I would, you know, if you have any new programs or projects that you're working on, I take a look and see what's going on here. Our uh, next round is opening up in January 15th. But as I said, focusing on programs that um, support youth and youth and youth ministries is important to the foundation. And we do have specific funds that help to seed the Seeds of Hope granting program that fund directly and specifically to youth and youth ministries. So I uh, just wanted to highlight that and to make sure you are all aware of that as we go into hearing about these wonderful works that our um, panelists have been doing as well. So we are excited, as I said, to uh, feature these former grant recipients and um, that have been engaging in addressing youth ministries in a diverse uh, range of ways. And now I'd love to uh, be able to introduce you to our panelists here. Um, we have Greg Powell from West Shore Community of Practice over on the uh, West Coast. Uh, we have Nancy Lee from the Tatamagush Center um, on the East Coast in Nova Scotia. And then we have uh, Heather Summer from Grace United Church in Hanover here in Ontario as well. So a good um, breadth and a good covering of our uh, very big, big country here. So mm -hmm. why don't we get started with uh, hearing from our panelists and hearing about their experiences. So the first question that I have for you all is, can you share the inspiration behind your project um, and how the ideas were conceptualized as well? And what needs in your communities uh, were you aiming to address with your projects? Greg, I see you're unmuted. If you Do you have a... A response to that? I sure do. Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you. And um, I'll, I'll briefly say that there are actually two projects. There's where we started and where we finished. And they um, aren't always the same. And in our case, they weren't the same. So where we started was I identified um, through listening to some podcast interviews and so on, the dearth of uh, coming of age rites of passage. And so I wanted to create something. And I have this uh, amazing luxury, really, of being a, a church plant. And my salary is fully granted through this church plant. So I'm part of the Pacific Mountain Regional Council. Uh, I'm working full time to create this new church expression. So I had the latitude to create this new program. And uh, and I so developed the idea that way, that we needed this new coming of age rite of passage. And I also believe that uh, we are a fairly risk averse culture, especially when it comes to children and youth. And so... Uh, the funders don't always want to hear this part, but I wanted to create a risky experience for children and youth. Now, I'll asterisk that uh, by saying that I, I like experiences that have a high perceived risk, but low actual risk. 
So a hiking trip or some kind of adventure like that, where there's actually fairly low risk, especially when you have the right communication aids and all that stuff, uh, but there's a high perceived risk. So children, youth can come through these experiences believing that they've achieved something great, um, maybe had a sense of being scared or um, uh, in a situation where they had to really dig deep and understand their own character. And so we created this program and it was a, a great program. Um, and then it turned out that I wasn't able to recruit enough youth. And I'm quite sad about that. And that was one failure that um, is on my shoulders that I carry, but we were able to pivot and turn it into a, a children's program. So we ended up doing it with children and their parents. And there were um, three families that got together to do this adventure out uh, in Strathcona Park on Vancouver Island. And I'm actually just going to show you very quickly where we are. I don't want to take too much time from the introduction. Actually, no, I'll, I'll save that for a moment. I'll let others go ahead. But the idea was to have this uh, adventure experience where uh, children and their parents could encounter each other, encounter nature, and encounter some uh, perceived risk, but low actual risk. That's wonderful. And I love your comment about uh, the starting line and the finish line. They're rarely the same when you're going into these projects. And I think especially knowing that we're looking at these kind of new developing projects, it's, it's wonderful to see when groups are able to pivot and shift and change and still find successes, even if it doesn't look like the way that they uh, envisioned at the start. Nancy and Heather, like do either of you- Thank you, Jenna. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy and Heather, do either of you have anything to share about um, kind of what those needs within your community or what that inspiration was uh, behind the, the projects? Nancy, go ahead. Sure, I'll go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, hi from Mi'kma'ki. I'm I'm calling I'm calling in from unceded, unsurrendered Mi'kmaq territory, and we're up on the North Shore, uh, Tatamagush in Nova Scotia. So we're a, a small uh, spiritual and justin oriented retreat center. Just to give you a little bit of background of the center first. Um, so our our project that was funded by Seeds of Hope really focused on the intergenerational. Uh, learning, healing, and and building up that leadership through that uh, connection. So what I found is we had a number of programs that were youth focused, and those are still very powerful. But what I feel is most powerful at Tatamagush Center, it's it's like a courage lab. It's the place where you come with an affinity group that you know and you love and you feel really comfy with, and you bump into different people, different bodies, different lived experience, and that's the magic. And so this project was particularly aimed to um, stimulate uh, people to be able to come across those different groups. So across generations, youth, so funding um, to address barriers, transportation, uh, income for registration, uh, caregiving uh, for youth, but also um, across the programs. And so the kinds of programs that uh, that we focused on, one is a collective gaming program, and that's uh, kind of storytelling, world building, very queer led and trans led, very neuro neurodiverse. Um, and one of the programs that just supports youth and others to create the worlds we want in 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 a playful uh environment so again uh working to ensure that we had youth with elders and seniors in those programs and not only for the senior to youth transmission of knowledge and gifts but the other way around we actually you know there's so much that uh young leadership including kind of climate activism and and, and the way that they um, ground their spirituality that, that they bring to others. Um, and the other programs were uh, a, a BIPOC gathering and uh, a multi-nation Indigenous uh, gathering, a longhouse build. Well, that's wonderful, Nancy. And I, I uh, that intergenerational aspect of uh, programming, um, you know, even Greg having uh, the parents join the children, I think that's something that we often miss out on. It's not all about how we are, uh, as the older commuters, elders are giving to children. We learn so much from being able to interact with and learn from our youth as well. And I, I love that aspect of that program. Heather, do you have any comments that you'd like to share? Sure. Um, 
Hi everyone, I'm Heather. Uh, I'm a musician and therapist and I live in West Grey, which is about two hours northwest of Toronto. Um, and I work as the, the children, youth and family support person at Grace United Church as well as direct the choir. Um, and did I say in Hanover? Yes, I did. Uh, okay. Um, so we received a, a Seeds of Hope grant to uh, essentially build a hand chimes program. Um, and uh, that very simply stemmed from an idea that one of the parents had. And I think that that was coming from a place of, uh, we were just on the tail end of coming out of, of COVID and um, just really missing ways that that people can gather and be together and uh, work on something as a group. And um, the nice thing about hand chimes was that, uh, as opposed to the choir, which has started now, but um, it was something where we could space out, where we, people could wear masks. It was very um, accessible in terms of you know people's ability to to be flexible within their own range of comfort. Um, and uh, yeah, and so it, get, it just started from there. A parent said, hey, can we do this? And I said, okay. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and it's just kind of, it, it snowballed. And so a group of us um, uh, got together and just brainstormed ideas of how to make it happen and purchased the, the chimes and what a program would look like. And we just went with it. <laughs> so. Well, that's wonderful. And I love that uh, idea of, you know, when, when we're working with youth programming and children's programming, addressing all the little minutiae around of what creates a safe program and an engaging program and a program that is meeting the needs of all of the, the different uh, kids that are getting involved. I think that that's something that is, you know, much more difficult than uh, many of us understand and realize and being able to pivot and really see that need within your community, especially during the difficult time of this, uh, that COVID, post-COVID kind of spaces um, and being able to find ways to interact in, in new and different ways. There's that mental flexibility uh, that's so important when working with youth. Thank you. Well, those are uh, great uh, ways to understand um, kind of where we get those places of inspiration where we have to see our programming with youth evolve. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go on to our next question here. So what impacts or impact have you witnessed in your community um, from these uh, different programs and projects that you've uh, been running and what have some of the outcome and what are, how have you witnessed those outcomes? Um, have you heard community feedback? Have you kind of had a sense of a continuation or any of that? <laughs> Heather, go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, uh, in the development of this program, um, it turned out that everyone, uh, not everyone, people from uh, a, across the, the church demographic were interested. And so um, I ended up developing, a, a, mostly because of numbers actually, a, a CHIMES program for kids and youth and families. Now, now their parents are involved as well. Um, and as well as one for just adults and seniors. So we have two separate programs and, um, and for our, for our, uh, our Advent season, they will be coming together, which is really nice. Um, and yeah, just, you know, they, they've been able to play at community events and at, in services and, um, you know, I get feedback from, from the, the congregation and, and community members saying how wonderful it is to just to see their progress and and um, uh, yeah, and what they're sharing in terms of their the the joy of of music together, um, and I, I also think you know Greg spoke of of risk and uh, Nancy spoke of courage, and I think that um, bringing music to people. Uh, takes both of those things. And, uh, you know, um, I, I personally have also just noticed um, how much the everyone who's been involved has just grown in terms of their 
learning a new skill and having the courage and taking the risk to play in front of people and make a mistake and failing together and learning together and learning when is it my turn to play and when is it my turn to listen and you know just ways of of showing up uh with and for each other that you know music is just such a a, a great container for all of those things uh, working as a group so um i'm very proud <laughs> and, yeah yeah it's very touching. It's no, it sounds like you have some of these uh, similar themes of this intergenerational play, right? Where you have, you know, again, you and this program that is teaching the youth these different lessons and these different life lessons and these good skills. But then you also have, you know, the the older uh, generations and the adults going, oh, maybe maybe I can participate in that and learn from that and those pieces as well. No, that's wonderful, Heather. Um, Greg, do you have a uh, piece to add? Yeah, and I will see if I can share a photo or two. Can you see those? Yes, photo? yeah. Excellent, nice. Uh, so that is the entirety of our group, um, a pretty small group, and many of us knew each other. I knew these folks in different ways beforehand, um, but I would say that the main impact, two main impacts, one is a deepening of relationship within the just the people that were there, um, and the other is just an experience of, of wilderness for the youngsters especially. So my daughter Eliana is in the middle there, and uh, on her, well, looking to the right of Eliana, if you're looking at the photo, is Antia. And then um, and they, they go to school together. And then to uh, the, the boy on the left is Orion. And they developed a really uh, beautiful bond. And it was really nice to see. And Ava, who is the woman there, it was her first time um, hiking. So she'd never done it before. Uh, she's very active and, and fit and strong. So it wasn't a challenge for her necessarily. Uh, but uh, just knowing that she could do that uh, it has opened up this gateway for their family. And we've actually talked about hiking trips in Costa Rica, probably just in uh, dreamful terms, but it'd be great to do. And then um, Matthew is the other man in that photo. And he and I have strengthened our bond. He's actually a rabbi here in Victoria. And uh, we were built, I would say we were, we were able to draw on the bond that we forged really during this trip recently, especially with all the conflict in Israel. So um, just having that depth of relationship that you get when you're spending 24 hours a day over a few days with somebody, um, going through some pretty dark moments, right? Like we were exhausted and beat and I was a little hypoglycemic at one point in one of the days and they saw me at my worst. And so now I'm not afraid to, uh, to be vulnerable with them. You know, maybe, um, it's a bit of an overstatement, but, uh, but there's certainly some depth there. And um, yeah, just knowing how, how strong we are to be able to, to do these things and to go in these places. We swam in some cold water. We saw some beautiful nature. Um, it was pretty outstanding. We were actually up on the iceberg there. We went in the water and uh, yeah, super fun. So where this leads, it's hard to say um, what happens next. I'm not entirely sure, but, um, but I know that there's, there's some beautiful relationship that's forming and hopefully there's more that comes out of this. And I'd love to actually repeat the trip too. And so use this as a way to kind of spread the word about what's possible out there. No, that's wonderful. And yeah, there's that kind of uh, beautiful thing that happens when you have these encounters out in nature where the physical stressors and the physical difficulty kind of help to develop some of that same resilience and relationships. And um, certainly it's one of those things you have the micro kind of changes and the the micro feedbacks you receive and the macro ones and some of those are just watching the journeys unfold and I think especially um, that's I'm sure you all know that that's a big challenge with these ministries is being able to be there for the long game and not just uh, in the interim so that no that's wonderful Greg lovely Nancy how how about you how have you seen some uh, impacts both, in your community both Heather and Greg's sharing is resonating the the music and arts and the adventure, the land-based, yeah, but the, for us too, very powerful. Um, I would say uh, with these programs, you know, similar to, to what's been shared, the connections, you know, the connections uh, between the youth of different backgrounds, the connections um, across youth and elders, you know, like one, I'm just looking at some of the, you asked like what, what, what some of the feedback was and one was, um, sharing how powerful it was to learn from some of the Indigenous elders at Longhouse Build. I think one of the things that became apparent that has influenced our programming going forward is 
regardless of what our backgrounds are, our ancestors, our spirituality, shared ceremony, and I think you spoke to this too, Heather, like shared ceremony, shared ritual, it's it's just so powerful in our gatherings. Um, and so that certainly came across. Um, the, the, the ability, you know, part of what we were wanting to do is um, build up some youth leaders from these different, different backgrounds. So one young African Nova Scotian um, woman just saying, these gatherings are so powerful. This is what our communities need. I'm, I'm willing, I'm committed to even raising some funds so that we can bring these back to our communities. So that kind of, that is always our intention is how can we be supporting uh, people where they are in their own work, in their own lives. Um, yeah. So I, I feel like some of these, some of the ripple effects is what's bubbling up as, as powerful. And, and with the gaming program, I mean, just the, a lot of it was just celebration of queer joy and, and creating worlds, creating new worlds. We've had people um, actually in transition, you know, trying on a new gender, that's a very powerful space. If, um, that's something that you're working through and you're doing it in, in a gaming environment. So um, I think we've learned a lot from the gaming community, this kind of collective storytelling community about, about safety, about how to hold permission for people from different backgrounds and bodies. And we're still learning about what that means to incorporate it. But yeah, I think there's lots of lots going forward. That's wonderful. There's this, I love how you're talking about this idea of holding ritual and creating space for ritual. And I think that's a lot of, you know, in, in traditional kind of uh, community faith practices, that's that space for holding ritual, but then also taking it to other communities and seeing your community where they're at with other ritual that is important and all those pieces at the same time as making space for something new, having new safe spaces, having new places of emerging um exploration I think that that's that's just wonderful and yeah uh knowing how to hold those pieces I think really speaks to the complexity of working with um with youth thank you so I'm going to go on to our next question here so in what ways uh do you all think that we can ensure that youth ministries embrace and celebrate diversity of backgrounds cultures and experiences among uh, young people and I know all of all three of you have uh, just thinking about this uh, celebration and this diversity and these different new experiences. I'm hearing those things from all of you, so I'm eager to hear your responses. I'm happy to go first this time. Thank you, Nancy. Um, <laughs> just just to build off of what I was saying before about um, yeah we our intention was to bring together people from diverse backgrounds and ages and i think a way to to do that is to cultivate the edges and what i mean by that um an example where elders were learning from youth so the longhouse build it was an all nations longhouse build it was largely indigenous ceremony um but one of the tensions was that the the ceremony was uh, male roles and female roles. And there was there were non-binary people at the gathering youth. And so um, there was a lot of learning from the elders about what what does that mean and how do we how do we hold these people to feel like they are part of this this gathering and these ceremonies? and and in fact, one of the non-binary, um, people ended up being a firekeeper. So I think that, you know, I think um, understanding where the edges are in our affinities in our communities and, and being able to provide a really radical hospitality to them that, that they, they don't have to check themselves at the door, that you intentionally welcome them um, is, is, is important. Yeah, that's what I share. Uh, there's that piece of intention. That's so true. Um... I think especially when we're working with uh, embracing, you know, difference and mar marginalized groups and pieces like that, that piece of intention, that's not just, oh yeah, come, we take everyone, but that intentionality of really focusing and saying, no, we really accept you as you come to us. Uh, and 
I think that that is just wonderful to hear and to remember uh, as we continue to think of how we interact with youth. Heather, do you have any uh, comments or reflections you'd like to share? Um, I think just for myself, um, my approach has been more one of um, asking questions. It uh, kind of takes me out of the role of feeling like I need to know what the right thing is for somebody, <laughs> as opposed to like, hey, what do you want? And what, what would feel good to you? And, you know, really uh, um, listening uh, with, with honest curiosity and um, flexibility and um, yeah, and, and start like, I mean, I, I can also get kind of macro with these things and, and then it can feel kind of overwhelming, but um, you know, even like making, keeping it personal in terms of like, re yeah, just checking in with, with people that I know. And then, you know, what, what about your friends or, you know, just kind of, uh, helps me to stay kind of grounded in, in, um, uh, and not get overwhelmed, I think, with the, you know, the potential magnitude of taking that kind of responsibility. Um, that I, you know, I do take seriously and, and, <laughs> and, it, and it can, it can, it feels like a big, a big thing. So um, I've, I've found that helpful just to, to ask and to listen and um, do my best. <laughs> I don't know if that's the... No, I think that's wonderful. I, I think I really appreciate that reminder of, um, to make space to listen to those around us. And especially with youth, I think it's easy uh, to get into the role with a lot of this programming of this is what the program is and this is what we have to do. But taking that moment to listen and ask the questions and not to get overwhelmed by the macro, as you said, but to remember, okay, let's let's work with what we have here and here and right now um, and not get too, uh, uh, I guess, buried under. Well, yeah. that's wonderful. Thank you, Heather. Greg, how about yourself? So one of the maybe shortcomings of our project is that we didn't recruit a lot of diversity, at least on the surface. But it turned out that when you have some Jewish folks and some folks in the United Church tradition and some Roman Catholic folks, you end up having pretty good diversity of thought and worldview. Um, and so, but I guess, so So we did get into some of that. And some of the beauty of a trip like this is that you just have the time. In fact, you're required to have the time. Um, I find that often if I'm getting into um, some kind of uh, disagreement over diverse perspectives, it's easy to kind of wrap up the conversation, move on in most situations. That's not my, my go-to normally, but I do find that tendency sometimes, right? It's like, oh, well, we don't have to really wrestle with this all that much. But when you're spending 24 hours over a few days with somebody, you kind of get time to work it out. It doesn't mean you always agree or come to any kind of resolution, but you can come through that conflict and realize that, oh, actually, we do have a relationship despite this Kind of ongoing disagreement which is great um the other comment i would add is children and youth have a in my experience for the most part have a natural tendency to celebrate diversity it's just it's exciting and it's fun and it's it's new um and it's often the adults that get in the way right either we try to force it or we try to prevent it or somehow we we kind of mess up those childhood or or youth experiences so one of the things that i like to do is is just get children youth together and then the adults kind of stir the pot a bit and then step aside and let them figure it out, especially when there's enough time to, to go with it in that regard. So I think that's, yeah, what I would say about that. Well, I think that's so important, that idea of time. Um, again, it's easy to get wrapped up in the program and what needs to get done, but just simply taking the time and allowing the time and the space, and especially allowing that time and space for celebration. Like you said, it's easy as the adults to, to get in the way and to uh, interject. And I think that that is such a wonderful thing to, a wonderful reminder is to uh, give space to our youth to celebrate um, and to watch how, how their interactions are uh, just coming about naturally as well. No, I, 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 yeah, I'm just making my notes here and, and just really seeing some of these practical ways of um, encouraging uh, these safe spaces and encouraging this acceptance of diversity of, you know, Nancy talking about that 
being intentional. Um, and Heather, you talking about asking the questions and I heard you talking about you give that time and make that space. I think that those are all wonderful and great ways to um, foster foster those safe spaces and encourage that uh, that diverse uh, thought and interaction. Thank you. Heather, go ahead. Um, I just I wouldn't mind adding just a, you reminded me, Greg, of um, in this particular, well, speaking to this particular project, the Hand Chimes project, um, you know, there we we do just intrinsically have diversity in our group within, um, you know, there is some cultural diversity, not a lot up in West Gray, but <laughs> there's some, uh, and there's some uh, diversity in ability. Um, but I, I did I did come up against something that that challenged me uh, early uh, at the beginning of this year, which was that, you know, trying to trying to rectify like okay this is this a church program um because there was a family that you know might have been interested in joining uh for the, the music aspect of it but they're jewish and so they didn't feel comfortable playing in services and so i really had to weigh like do i want to include them and not have us play in services or do I like that's it's it's, it's funded by the church, you know, like where, what is our role here and and who are we serving and it's it's yeah it's, it's not always um, an easy answer. Um, and it's hard to accept limits at times, I think, for me too. Um, uh, limitations around those things so um, yeah I just wanted to speak to that that you know that that that's been an experience that that I had that was challenging um, for me in terms of knowing how to navigate it. Nancy, go ahead. Like now you've stimulated something for me too. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I would say, I mean, I think um, at this time, at least for us as a as a spiritual justice oriented retreat center, I feel it's it's really our responsibility to be holding these these very conversations like it, it's we're working on a process of what we call loving accountability there are microaggressions and transgressions all the time because because we encourage different different groups to come together and you can't know what someone ha is bringing in terms of lived experience um and triggers and 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 personal collective trauma so um yeah i think it's really important that 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 we're that we're, we're always facing these kinds of things i agree with heather like you know um i think it's important to be uh honest and transparent and 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 try to hold that as a space um together and it's something we're we're really intentionally working at and it's not easy but um yeah I think that I take that well that, you know, there are going to have to be constraints. There's no such thing as, you know, a program that is just as wide and broad and deep and everything, and it can still be um, really effective. I think, you know, we have to have constraints on things. But Nancy, I also take your point that we need to be intentional with the way that we interact and discern and decide how we foster spaces and how we um, speak around those things. And especially thinking about this with the youth. I think one of the things with kids and youth is that they watch us and how we deal with these things. And I just keep thinking about uh, Greg's experiences. You know, when you're there 24 hours a day with one another, you see how that conflict comes about. You can see how that conflict resolution hopefully comes about as well. You know, certainly dealing with the conflicts and dealing with those tensions, those constraints are, are, are such a truth. for the life pieces. Let's move on. So, uh, Sorry, go ahead, Nancy. Abigail, or I just see a hand. <laughs> I don't know if you're taking. We're going to have some time at the end okay. for some My questions. So I am on time. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to move on to. Uh, so in terms of your interactions with the foundations, um, with the foundation, I'd love to know, uh, if you can describe what the process of coming to the United Church of Canada Foundation and deciding to apply for Seeds of Hope grant. Um, what was that process like? What was that experience like? Um, and how has uh, 
you know, the Seeds of Hope granting program and uh, the relationship with the United Church of Canada Foundation helped uh, to, to grow these programs, projects, and communities. Um, I, can, I can answer very succinctly. Uh, I hadn't heard about it until our minister suggested that we check it out. And I said, okay, and then we applied and it was fairly straightforward. <laughs> um, and you know, it, it's, it, we couldn't have done it. We couldn't have, we couldn't have done this without the grant. Um, so I'm very grateful and, and, uh, and yeah, it, I mean, I've done granting processes in different, uh, areas of my life before, but this, you know, it was, I found it fairly straightforward in comparison. <laughs> so, yeah. That's wonderful to hear. I feel like there's that tension of wanting to make sure we have these programs set up so that we get all the information that we need to make thoughtful decisions at the same time as you don't want a process to be so onerous that it uh, keeps people from wanting to apply. So that's wonderful feedback to hear and I'm glad to that, Heather, that you're joining us today to share about your program and your experience so that hopefully uh, those that are joining us today have um, more knowledge and idea of the uh, Seeds of Hope Funding Program and on the foundation as well. So thank you. I'll echo that. It was The whole process was very smooth, very straightforward. Um, I knew about the program because I had actually led another youth trip um, close to 10 years ago now um, to the Northwest Territories. So I was familiar with the Seeds of Hope program from that, um, but being able to navigate it was just as easy now as it was then. And when we had to make our pivot from being a youth and young adult trip to kind of a children and parents trip, that pivot was was smooth and, um, you know, all was forgiven and blessed and it was, it was great. So uh, nothing but positive things to say. Wonderful, that's good to hear. Nancy, did you have anything uh, else to share or add to that? I don't have anything that's uh, really dramatically different. I would just say that um, I joined in 2020, just as COVID hit. So um, we had received Seeds of Hope funding. And I, what I would say is there was, I, w I appreciated the flexibility um, that, you know, was given to, to be able to, as you said, pivot during that time, because there was quite a lot of pivoting. Um, yeah, but but what I felt was, as long as we were we were mission aligned and the intention was there and and in impact we were so I appreciated that I think that's important in a funder with the with the communities that we're working with and um, yeah. You're muted, Jenna. I'm wondering if we could take Abigail's question. Apologies, I was muted there. I was just saying, uh, yeah, we, I, it, it seemed like I wasn't on mute because I was saying, why don't we go into a time of questions now and if we can take um, Abigail, if you would like to put your question forth either through the chat or unmute yourself. Good morning, welcome. Um, I'm just wondering why it was a question in the first place if the Jewish family should be included if they're Jewish and we're United Church because we all pray to the same God. We're all supposed to be welcoming of everyone. Why was that even a thought that came through that confused me dramatically, as well as the diversity of Jewish, Catholic, and Christian? Again, we're all the same God of Abraham and Sarah. I, I don't feel it's that much diversity myself, being the, the only person seeing a diversity in the BIPOC or things like that, that I I'm, I'm just have a very different perspective and would love an explanation that could help me understand yours. Um, I should just clarify, it wasn't that they weren't included on our side. Uh, we definitely included them. We said, you're absolutely welcome to come. This is what we do. And they said, actually, we don't feel comfortable participating in, in services. So I said, okay, but you know, of course that, yes, of course they were welcome in, 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 on, <laughs> on our side of things like, yeah, sure. Come anybody, anybody come. And, you know, we did have, uh, the first year, quite a few, um, kids involved that weren't a part of our congregation. Uh, they were friends or, or, you know, I put up posters in the library and people, you know, checked it out and, um, anybody was welcome, but that, that just was being that it was a, um, uh, 
funded by the church. The church wanted to wanted to see what they were doing, and um, so that was just part of it. Is you know, this is this is what we participate. We only we only play in church probably three times in a year, kind of thing, um, as well as in community events and things if we're if we're invited. But um, yeah, just to clarify, it wasn't it wasn't on our end that they weren't. Uh, they weren't included. It was their, it was their, their comfort. And, and I just, all I can just, all I can say is, okay, I respect that, you know, that that's, um, that was their, their comfort. So. Thank you for the clarity. That makes me feel a lot better. I was very yeah. concerned wondering why we yeah. weren't including people. No, 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 no. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Just to kind of piggyback off of that as well. I think that one of the difficult pieces of, um, being part of the, uh, of, uh, church spaces can be that even when we want to intentionally reach out to people in our communities, sometimes the church can be an uncomfortable space. So uh, knowing how to have those conversations and knowing how to foster those spaces. And I know that the focus of our conversation has been on how are we um, focusing on our, our youth ministries and pieces like that. But I'm sure if any of you uh, have comments on how you kind of navigate those difficult pieces, because I'm sure it also comes up with just uh, pieces of uh, just general differences between styles of working with kids and parents of what they'd like to see as well. I don't know if any of you have any thoughts on um, that, those interactions. Well, yeah, I would say we, we definitely navigate that space. We consider ourselves, I mean, we, we wholeheartedly thank United Church as being one of our core supporters, but we consider ourselves interfaith. And that includes people who do not uh, follow a faith. We have Wiccans and we have people who um, may consider them some spiritual and some who, you know, wouldn't even have an identifier of any kind. And so there's actually at this time been a lot of debate around what that means. And we're very intentional about our symbols, including the cross for some holds a lot of trauma for First Nations, residential school survivors. And so again, being honest in that, United Church is one of the leaders in stepping forward to apologize. And so I, I think again, to, to just be real, you know, and, and say uh, all, of, all of you is welcome and we don't prioritize any symbols over others, any, any bodies over others. It's very difficult to do well and you make a lot of mistakes, but I think, um, it's what we are being called to if we are really committed in, I, I'm a Zen practitioner myself, but if we're committed in our faith, I think that's what we are being called to, to be, to be bold in our faith, frankly. Bold discipleship, as we might say. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. Thank you, Nancy. Um, do we have any other questions that people might have for our panelists here? So I just, I would have one more quick question for you all. Um, what advice would you want to give to anyone thinking about uh, applying for a similar project, whether or not it's about the application or whether or not it's about your experience of uh, developing these programs and projects? And uh, what are some of those? I mean, we've heard a little bit of, about some of the conflicts and some of the uh, pieces that didn't go quite to plan, but, you know, just a freeform question of reflection of what, what would that... Uh, advice be that you would give? I think for myself, um, I just really appreciated um, the inclusion of others. And, and I think that that was a part of that being um, the, the brainstorming of ideas of what could this be. And uh, I didn't feel like I had to just come up with everything on my own and, uh, and, and, and taking feedback of what people want and what would they be interested in and what are their schedules like and all of this stuff. And, uh, as well as in the, the granting application process, uh, there were a couple of us that took it on together. And, and I also found that to be really supportive in terms of, um, you know, it, it is, it's straightforward and it's lengthy. And, uh, so, you know, having ha just, yeah, including others, I think, and, and um, um, having a supportive team uh, was really helpful for me. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Uh, 
operating in a vacuum is where I always can get myself in trouble. And then as soon as I reach out for help is when I go, oh yeah, I didn't need to make it that difficult. That's always an important thing to remember. Thank you. Greg, do you have any pieces of, of advice or wisdom that you can share with us? Sure. My first piece of advice is to be ambitious. I mean, think big. There's there's money available either through the Seeds of Hope or elsewhere, maybe both. Uh, so dream big and and go for it. And if it doesn't work out the first time, you know, try again. Um, there's lots of lots to learn, even if the application isn't successful the first time, or the project doesn't go the way you want the first time. There's lots lots of ways to learn and grow from that. And to keep in mind that everybody wants you to succeed. We're all cheering for you, right? Whether it's the funder or the others on this call or elsewhere, we all want these projects to go ahead and and to have an impact and um, help manifest the kingdom of God where we all see each other as siblings and where there is peace and love for all. So we're all cheering for you. Aim big. I love that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Be ambitious. Um, we had a question come in the back and asking about how long between grant cycles can you wait to apply? And, you know, you can apply for more than one Seeds of Hope grant at a time. You can apply every season, uh, every granting season, if you would like. We run them in the fall and the spring of each year. Um, you know, we can't, obviously, we can't grant every program, especially as, uh, you know, more and more stories come our way. But, you know, we we want to be able to work with you to really achieve your 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 visions and to you know help dream. You know that's the point I think when we're talking about new and innovative ministries like or new and innovative programs um, like we do. Well, like we're looking at what seeds of hope is really trying to push the boundaries and knowing that success doesn't always equal doing things exactly the way you first envisioned it. And sometimes again, it is that pivot and it is being able to. Um, learn and grow and develop. Um, and we want to be able to walk with uh, people and groups through through those processes as well. And yeah, like you said, Greg, we're all cheering for you. Nancy, do you have any other comments you'd like to share? I'd echo, I don't have a lot to share, maybe taking a page out of Heather's book. I, I, I would say listening, really listen. There's a lot of fierce youth leadership. So really um, listening closely to what they have to say about what's needed. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. And I think that that's, um, I think being able to listen to our communities and to those that we're working with and who who you're creating these programs uh, or trying to develop programs with and for those demographics, I it's too easy to get on your own tangent, but to really listen, I, I love them. And what a wonderful reminder. Um, we have another question that's come in. Um, Andrew asks, I'm curious, how are the panelists using technology to engage the message and youth in young with these and young families. Not sure if any of you have experience with that or anything you'd like to share. Nancy, go ahead, Greg. Were you? Oh, I, I um, I'm fairly anti-technology, actually. <laughs> uh, not really, but sort of in the sense that I think social media can be a, an awful addiction for a lot of people. Um, I've had a social media addiction probably myself. So I really encourage just face to face. Now I I know that that's not the only way, and I know that you Andrew are doing some interesting things, and that sounds cool. Uh, but for me, I I really encourage the analog face to face, get outside, be together. Nancy, what did you have to share? Um, I'd love to hear what Andrew's up to, but um, <laughs> we we are doing things. I mean, we definitely had to pivot online for COVID. We weren't, we didn't have that experience. It was it was brand spanking new for us. We we were a hub, deep steep learning curve. Um, but I think where we've landed, um, like Greg, we like we're land based, and and being together around a bonfire and food is so important. So I think where we've landed now, and especially with Northern Shore winters, if you knew them, is hybrid programming. So in the winter, we're doing online that leads to a gathering. And I think that's a nice place for us. Um, we're also going to experiment with online almost as tasters for gathering. Um, so that's a little bit, the other thing we're doing is a tracing our roots through food program where different people from different backgrounds are sharing their food stories and, and, you know, re actual recipes cooking together. And we want to try that hybrid because I think it lends itself. Um, and then the last thing that we that we did that was, uh, that really worked well, and we're going to do more of is 
partnering with our sister centers, Five Oaks and Narmrata across the country and doing simultaneous programming. So we did one, I think it was in 2022, where we did, you know, combining spirit and justice um, and how we were doing that. We actually combined with Iona in Scotland as well. And so I think there's real power there in, in what's possible across our spaces. So, yeah. Oh, that's great. I love that idea of using technology as a way to bridge those in-person gatherings, but also as a way to connect with people who geographically are really far removed from you, but also on similar paths and spaces. But yeah, I take right your um, comment as well, the importance of face-to-face uh, -face and in-person when, when possible. Okay, we have a few minutes left. I just want to make sure there are no other questions before we uh, begin to uh, close up. But yeah, I just want to thank uh, Greg, Nancy, and Heather. Thank you all so much for joining us and for sharing your experiences um, and for sharing the way that uh, you've been able to interact with the Foundation Seeds of Hope, but also just sharing your, um, you know, really, really your wisdom on how you have reached out into your communities and how you have been working with uh, the youth in your communities to develop um, programming that fits them and programming that challenges them. Um, programming that uh, connects them not just to themselves but also to those intergenerational spaces as well. I, it's it's been wonderful to hear from you guys. So thank you. You're welcome. Oh. Um, I also just wanted you know a few housekeeping. Sorry, Greg, do you have something? Just wanted to echo. Thank you for hosting. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you for inviting us and and thank you to all who are here. Yeah. Pleasure to be here. Blessings wow. to. All. And yeah, so yeah, thank you. Um, and just uh, before we leave, I just want to do a few housekeeping pieces again. Um, just a reminder that this recording will be available uh, through the United Church of Canada uh, YouTube page. And we'll make sure if you were registered today, you'll get a link to that in the coming week. Um, again, for Seeds of Hope, grant uh, requests. We have our next uh, round opening up on January 15th and that will accept applications till until April 15th. Um, again, the web, uh, Ashley has uh, put in the websites in the chat if you wanna be able to take a look at that. She's also put in the foundation um, email address there. And just so you all know that it's not just a disparate email that no one monitors. We have a number of us that monitor it, and I'm usually the first person in the morning to look at them every day, and we try and get back to you within, um, you know, a day or a day or two. So we do our best to be able to make sure that we're getting you personalized responses. So if you do have questions, please do feel free to reach out. If you have other questions for our panelists as well, feel free to send a message out uh, to our foundation email. We'll make sure to uh, forward all those pieces as well. Um, yeah, so uh, again, thank you. And just a reminder that our next Works in Action webinar uh, is going to be on Towards Food Security, and that's going to be on Thursday, December 14th. So keep your eyes open for that. But yeah, I just want to thank, um, again, all of our panelists, as well as all of you uh, participants who have been joining us and hearing and learning about some of the wonderful works that's being done. Thank you. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day.